Hello, and welcome to another History Hullabaloo with Miss Beth here at Pueblo West Library. Today we're going to be talking all about castles, one of my favorite subjects of all time. Um, when I was a little kid, I used to dream of living in one, and I used to study them and look at pictures of them all the time. And maybe you are the same way. Maybe you love to think about them and love it to look at pictures and read stories about castles. So what do you think when you hear the word castle? Do you think of lords and ladies, or kings and queens, princes and princesses, dragons or trolls? Well, we're here today to kind of talk about what the, the real uh, truth is behind the castles. And certainly reading all those fantasy stories about castles are, are fun, and you, you keep on doing that. Um, but we're going to learn about the facts today. So they were more than just big fancy houses. They were kind of like mini towns in themselves, uh, surrounded by giant brick walls or stone walls. Um, so let's explore some of the things that they did within those walls and who lived there and how they built it and all those sorts of things. So the first castles were built a uh, thousand years ago, even longer ago than that. Um, and they were originally made of wood and some were built uh, even more recently than that, maybe within the past hundred years or so. So maybe you've been to um, Bishop's Castle here in Colorado. That's kind of our, our famous castle here in the state. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty cool place to go. Um, and usually castles were built in Europe, like England and France and Germany. But there's castles all over the world, really. Um, you can find them in any country, like Japan and Spain and Portugal and um, I have some photos that I'll show you later of castles that are in those countries, and of course they all have their own unique design, and um, their look to them is all different, but they pretty much all have the same purpose. Um, so let's take a look at that. So why exactly were they built? Um, so when you see giant castles, what do you think of? Do you see the big structure here, and who do you think would live there? probably somebody rich and somebody powerful. Um, so that is why they wanted to build uh, such big, large places to live. It was kind of a show of their wealth and power in the area. Um, but it was more than that. It was kind of like a central meeting place if they had to hold meetings. And um, it also provided protection. Because back uh, when the castles were really a big thing, back in the medieval ages, there was a lot of warfare going on and uh, people would retreat behind the walls of the castle to, for its protection because it was very hard to get through those walls. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later too. Um, so what were castles made of? Earlier on I had said they were usually, uh, the early ones were made of wood, but later on they started to be built out of stone. Um, and they took many, many years to build. Uh, sometimes a king or a lord would say, I want this castle built, and he wouldn't even live long enough to see the finish of it because it took so long, many, many years, even decades to build. Um, so I wanted to show you a picture here, some pictures of what it might look like as a, a timeline of a castle being built. So this is when its walls first start to be built going up. And it's very simple. It has the outer wall here, but there's not a lot of fancy stuff going on. Um, and this is when it was within the first few years of when it was built. And later on, as you can see, it gets fancier. And this is actually at the end when they have all the brick built and all the stone built and all the roofs put on and the windows and there's people inside. So you can really see that it uh, started out as this and then it went to that. And you, of course you would think that that would take a very, very long time. Um, and there was many sorts of people who worked on castles. Um, it was more than just a one-man job. So I have a few pictures here of, of uh, the types of people who might work on a castle. You have the diggers who would dig the dirt and the trenches. Um, you have the carpenters who would work with the wood. Um, you have the quarry men, which were actually the men that dug the stone out of the hillsides to um, cut it and then put it and build it for the castle. Um, and you have the blacksmiths that would make the metal, and the cartmen that would transport the rocks, and the masons who would help put it all together, the mortar makers, um, and let me explain what mortar is. So 
mortar was kind of the cement that went between the blocks here that kept it all together and it was made out of lime and sand and a little bit of like smaller pebbles put in there to hold it all together um, and mixed with water. So those are everyone, those are all the people who might uh, help in building a castle. And I kind of want to show you what they would do with the rocks that they took out of the quarry. They would shape them and then they would lay them out like this and kind of stack them like bricks. You might see a brick building today built like this and they would just stack them. And then in between the cracks here, in between the cracks of the rocks, they would put the mortar, the sand, lime, and um, water mixture, and that would hold it all together. And then, as you can imagine, this would take many, many, many years to get a big wall built, big enough to hold a castle inside. So, now that you kind of know how they were built, um, let's take a look at basic layout of a castle. So. I'll show you right here. We have started here um, what they would call the outer curtain. Yeah, curtain like you would have it hanging in the window. And this was the very outer wall that protected um, everything inside of it. And then on the outer curtain, you would have what they call the gatehouse with its little um, gateway through the entryway. And these little cross beams here would be the portcullis, which could come down. Um, and protect that gate. It was kind of like the door, the gate the, that protected the people from coming in or leaving. And oftentimes, as you may know, they would have a moat in front of the castle, which is pretty much a big trench dug that's filled with water and it makes it hard for enemies to cross because they would have to cross the water before they even get to the gate. And then here's our drawbridge to cross the water, which they could lift up if needed to prevent access. So there's our drawbridge, there's our outer curtain, and of course you need the guard towers at all the corners to watch from all directions. And as you can see on top of the guard towers here, they have what they call crenellations, which are kind of um, squares on top of the towers, and it kind of helped people to duck down from their enemies if they needed to, but also to be able to see. And then inside, we have another wall called the inner curtain. And this just provided another layer of protection, and this would probably have a gatehouse in it too. And then in the very, very center, that's where all the, the living took place, all the day-to-day -day activities. So um, this is where the royal family would live, or whoever the lord or lady was, in the, the royal apartments here. And we have a great hall, which is where they would have all their feasts and banquets and um, big meetings. We have a chapel, which is kind of like a small church, um, because back when they were living in these castles, they um, had very strong religious beliefs, and they would always be sure to have um, some sort of priest on hand um, and be sure to ch attend the church services on a weekly basis. We also have things like a garden, because um, they grew all their own food inside the castle. Um, so they would grow things like onions and beans and um, all manner of things that they could eat. And then there would be some other buildings in here, like a kitchen and a blacksmith shop and a stable and um, maybe some other little smaller buildings where people lived. And pretty much um, this was a place for, you know, the center of community to happen for the royal family to kind of um, oversee what was happening and also for the common folk outside of the castle area to come in and mingle with other people and also if they needed protection from the outside. So once in a while, um, you would get kind of like skirmishes and warfare going on. Um, and those were all the outer threats coming from different lands around the castle. And they would bring all sorts, sorts of war machines um, that they would try to breach the castle walls with. Um, these were called siege machines, actually. And I have a few pictures here. So this is called a trebuchet, which is pretty much like a giant catapult. So they would um, launch big boulders from that over the walls and through the walls, trying to knock them down. 
And then we have this thing, which is, they, they parked it right next to the wall, right here, and then they would climb up the stairs or the ladder here and try to go over top of the wall. Um, and if uh, somebody was on top of the wall trying to shoot down at them with their bow and arrow, they, were, they had protection by being inside of that. So, and I have some pictures from our book again to show you of some of these machines in use. There's the one I was just talking about where they climb the walls. And this is called the battering ram. And what they did with this, um, see the long pole here, and it had a um, point on the end. And what they would do is they would swing it towards the gatehouse door right here and try to burst through it. So this door um, right here, they would try to burst through that with the battering ram. And sometimes they were successful, and they ended up getting through it. In the castle. <laughs> other times, not so much, and it didn't work out for them. Um, but other threats to the castle were um, things like disease and famine, because a lot of times the weather didn't agree, um, and they couldn't grow their crops. So people would often flock from the outer countryside to the castle to um, seek relief from the lord who lived there. Um, so I have a book here that's going to tie all this together for us. And then I'll show you some pictures after that. This is called Castle, How It Works by David McCauley. And this is actually, he's one of my favorite authors for explaining um, buildings that were built long ago. Um, the, the pictures in here, the illustrations are really cool. And he just explains it in a fun way. I just really enjoy it. So it's by uh, David McCauley and published by Macmillan Children's Publishing Group. So as I read the book, you can kind of see um, our, our layout here as it goes along with the story. The castle stands high on a rocky hill. It has tall towers and thick stone walls, doors of wood and iron, and a wide moat. Remember we had talked about the moat, the water in front of the castle? And there is no welcome mat. People cannot just walk into a castle. The castle was built to keep the people inside safe. It keeps other people safely outside. Are you friend or foe? Which means if you're a friend, they would stop you at the gate and they would ask you um, who you are and what your business is. And um, if they deemed you a friend, they would let you in. But if you were a foe, if you're an enemy, then you had to stay outside the walls. If you are a friend, you must first climb a steep ramp. It ends at a wooden drawbridge. Follow me up here. The drawbridge crosses the moat, and you are now facing the outer wall. It's called the outer curtain. You walk toward the first gatehouse. A tower stands on each side. Guards decide who can come in, and they watch everyone very closely. Welcome, friend. So they've decided that you're a friend, and you can come in. When you get past the guards, you are still not all the way in. There is another wall in front of you, even taller than the outer curtain. It's called the inner curtain, which is this one right here. It has an even bigger gatehouse. So there would be another gatehouse on this, this wall right here. You guessed it, more guards. The inner curtain has a high tower at each of its four corners. Guards can see for miles from the tops of these towers, and they can shoot their arrows in every direction. So these towers were actually really tall, these ones. And the guards would stand on the top or through the windows, and just they could see forever and ever. Any enemy that is approaching, they will be able to see from those towers. You are deep within the castle. Welcome to the inner ward. This courtyard is a lively place. Horses are fed in the stable, and below the barracks, soldiers are playing a game. The blacksmith makes a new horseshoe. So this is the inner ward where all of the um, action takes place. The blacksmith's children are chasing chickens, and the cook builds a big fire in the kitchen. The cook's helper draws water from the well. He must water the garden. And the dog gets a drink, too. Yes, they had pets, too, that lived in the castle.
the Lord and Lady live on, in one of the high towers. That would have been right here. The walls of these rooms are painted, and fresh herbs are tossed on the floor. This makes the room smell good. Huh, interesting fact. You would toss herbs on the floor to kind of give it a good scent. Kind of like our modern day version of candles. A spiral staircase goes all the way up to the roof. So spiral of it goes round and round and round. Guards keep watch from the walls and towers day and night. The ground floors filled with dried food and barrels of wine and cider. And beneath the ground floor is the dark, damp dungeon where they kept their enemies. Pretty much like their version of a jail or a prison. The chapel is another high tower. The priest is one of the few people in the castle who can read. The roof above the chapel collects rainwater and it flows through a pipe into a tank and then all the way down to the kitchen sink. Hmm, another interesting fact. Oh, there's the guard and it says, can you hear his teeth chattering? It often got very cold up on top of these walls. The largest building in the inner ward is the Great Hall. Let's see if that looks this. The Great Hall has fireplaces in the walls. It has tall windows to let in light, and servants arrange tables and benches. They put out wooden bowls and spoons, but no plates. People will use thick slices of stale bread for their plates, called trenchers. And the Great Hall will soon be ready for dinner. They are in the Great Hall getting ready for their feast. If you are a foe or an enemy, you won't be let in. To capture the castle, you will have to surround it and wait. This is called a siege. A siege stops supplies from getting into the castle. So they would surround it with their armies and prevent anything from getting in or out. And this could last a very, very long time, sometimes even years. And that's why it says here, but you'd better be patient. Remember all the dry food in the towers and don't forget the water in the well. Your army may surround the castle, but the people inside can last a very long time. So they started out in what looks like summer or spring and it's all the way winter now and they're still waiting outside the castle walls. Are you in a hurry? You'll have to get past the town wall first. Bring on the battering ram. Remember what the battering ram was? Was the giant log that tried to burst through the uh, gate, the front door pretty much. And it says the battering ram hangs by chains inside a wooden shed. You swing it back and forth and it hits the wall hard. <clears throat> If you make a big enough hole, you can crawl through it. Now you can open the gatehouse doors and let your soldiers in. So actually here they're trying to break through the actual wall and then they can open the gate from the inside. But the soldiers inside can see you coming. Guards remove the supports under the drawbridge and one end flips up and the other end drops down. No more bridge. so. The drawbridge right here is going to flip up. You could wheel in a catapult. It looks like a giant wooden spoon and you can fire big heavy rocks. So there's a catapult and then there's the battering or the um, drawbridge. Perhaps you could build a ladder to scale the outer curtain. Wait until dark, you might get as far as the inner gatehouse. But slam! The portcullis crashes down behind you. So that was this, these cross beams here, the portcullis. Heavy doors block the other end of the passage. You are trapped. Guards above drop rocks and hot water and through the ceiling, through holes in the ceiling everything they can do to try to prevent people from getting inside.
If he do get through this gatehouse, there are many more soldiers waiting. They patrol the battlements along the tops of all the walls and towers. And archer, archers wind up shooting the flaming arrows. Oh no! It's no use. Your men are brave and willing to fight. But in the end, you must give up. You did your best, but the castle is too strong. The dungeon is now full, and the rest of your army disappears into the woods. Slowly, the inner ward comes back to life. The mess will be cleaned up tomorrow. Tonight, there will be a celebration. And the cook has put away his bow and arrows and grabbed a spoon. Bring on the meat, beans, onions, and puddings. And please don't forget the eel pie. Yes, they did eat eels back then. And there's our picture of our castle layout again in the back. So that's the end of that book. So you can really see how a castle would be helpful in protecting you from the enemy. Or if you're the enemy, you would see what you, all you have to go through just to get inside. And why castles are so effective at providing defense. So let me show you a few pictures um, that I have here. And remember what we've been learning, that these are called primary sources because they were um, created at the time um, that the people actually lived. So first off, I wanted to show you um, what they called a plum bob line, which is how they made sure that the walls were nice and level. You know how today we have the little um, levels with the bubbles in the middle and that tells you when uh, it's nice and flat. Well, this is what they would use back then. And it was pretty much when you lay this on the wall, um, there's a weight at the end of this string and it would have to hang right in the middle of this hole right here. And if it was right in the middle, that means your wall is level. If it's a little to the side here, it means you gotta fix that angle a little bit. So that is a medieval version of a level. And right here, I wanted to show you um, this was from the year 1291, which was a long time ago, centuries ago, hundreds of hundreds of years. And it is um, written by a um, lord, and it asks, or it gives somebody permission to start building a castle. It says, license for Lawrence of Ludlow to strengthen his dwelling house of Stokesay with stone walls and to crenellate his castle. As you can see the writing here, he wrote it out in an actual document to make it official. And then I have some medieval paintings that show you um, a siege on a castle when they're trying to invade it. And you can see the guards sitting on top of the walls with their spears and arrows and then the invading army trying to break through. And if you look closely, you can even see the moat in the front and the guard towers. And I have another one here that kind of points out the different parts or shows the different parts of the castle with the moat in the front, the gatehouse, and they had some farm fields um, beyond the walls. So here's the outer curtain wall and all the guard towers. This is a pretty big castle, as you can see. And this is from a um, painting, painted in the 1400s. And then some pictures of some actual castles. This is Rochester Castle in Great Britain. So once again, the towers and the crenellations at, to at the top, the windows that the guards could see through. Oh, look at this. It gives you a uh, view of the inner ward inside the inner curtain where all the activity happened. So this is um, Ludlow Castle over in Great Britain. And it gives you kind of a sense of how big these castles were. And you can even see how they would lay the stones on top of each other for the wall. All 
Our next one is Lindisfarne, and I like this one because it's way up on top of a hill. And that was um, beneficial because it allowed the guards to see you even farther than they would have if they were on flat land. So imagine yourself standing on a hill and how much farther you could see in the distance than if you were just standing on a flat piece of ground. So that's why they chose the boat on that hill. Oh, and then we have a more recent castle. This is Nishvanstein. I think it's in Switzerland, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe. So you can see the difference um, in the style of this building. More modern and then um, older with the rock, but still very much a castle. And then I have two more pictures here of castles from a different part of the world, Japan. Um, so I just wanted to give you an idea of what a castle might look like outside of Europe. And this is Matsumoto Castle in Japan. Still a very, very beautiful, big building. But doesn't look quite the same as a European castle. And then this one is Osaka Castle, also in Japan. And still used for um, defense and a show of wealth and power. Just a different building style. So now that you've got to see um, different kinds of castles throughout the world, I also wanted to share a craft that you can actually come and pick up here at Pueblo West Library. Um, if you come to the front desk here, um, I will give you a little to-go kit in which you can build your very own royal crown. Just on top of your head and act like you're living in a castle. So in the bag here, you'll get uh, the piece that goes around your head and then the pieces that curve over the top. I'll give you directions also in the bag to tell you how to do that. Um, you'll get the red inner part that makes it actually look like a crown. And the best part, you'll get tons of little jewels. Let me show you an example. So you can decorate your crown with royal jewels and make it really special. And then you can be a little lord or lady living in your very own castle. Ta-da! So stop by Pueblo West Library and get one of these kits for yourself to take home. And um, have fun with it. Decorate it however you want. So that's it for today um, after you learned all about castles. And I hope you can join us next time when we learn about the Vietnam War in October. Um, so join us then and I hope you have a good rest of your weekend. Bye!